13e graphs of tangent. We are going to start today by looking at what will a graph, a standard cycle graph of tangent look like. As a warm up, I think it'd be a really good idea for you guys to go through and find these exact values for all the x values we have for tangent. So start by finding tangent of zero all the way through until you get tangent of negative pi over two. I'm going to suggest that you pause the video now and try those. Okay, let's go ahead and check those. So tangent of zero is zero, tangent of pi over four is equal to positive one since we're in the first quadrant, tangent of pi over three is equal to root three, and then tangent of pi over two is the first place where we see that tangent is actually undefined since when we're looking at the unit circle we would get one over zero at that coordinate pair which is going to create a value that is then undefined since that is a big no that i cannot divide by zero in math because we hit undefined here at pi over two that's why i'm going to have us start looking at negative angles so when we're looking for a standard graph of a trig function we want to make sure that that graph piece is continuous meaning there's nothing that would be breaking it apart but once I hit tangent of pi over two and I have this undefined value, this is gonna cause us to have a vertical asymptote on the graph, which means the graph is not gonna be continuous from one side of that to the other. So we're gonna instead look at negative values since I was able to get all of these leading up to pi over two, I should be able to get some leading to negative pi over two. So if we start checking our three negative values that we have here, we have tangent of negative pi over four, that's gonna be equal to negative one. Just as a little reminder, when I have a negative angle, remember that we are rotating uh, clockwise versus counterclockwise. So negative pi over four would be right there at, at, with a 45 degree reference angle in quadrant four, and it has a positive root two over two, a negative root two over two, and then a one, if I'm drawing the reference triangle out. Likewise, tangent of negative pi over three is also gonna be in quadrant four. It's gonna be the next angle past that, which will be negative root three. And then just like we saw with tangent of pi over two, if I have tangent of negative pi over two, what's gonna end up happening is again, I'm gonna get an undefined value since when I'm on the unit circle, negative pi over two is down here on the negative y axis and we're at the coordinate pair zero comma negative one. So when I'm finding tangent, I have y over x, so negative one over zero, which would end up giving me an undefined value then. We can use this then to start sketching our first graph of tangent that we will see. So we talked about this when we first looked at pi over two, but these undefined values that I'm getting at positive pi over two and negative pi over two for tangent are gonna produce vertical asymptotes on the graph. So I'm gonna start by drawing those. Remember when we draw an asymptote, we sketch it with a dotted line. And I'm gonna make sure that I'm labeling everything. So this guy is gonna be our positive pi over two. If I'm trying to make it as symmetric as possible, this would be about our negative pi over two. And we started with those guys there. Uh, let's go back to the first couple points here and let's see what we get. So I have zero comma zero. For this first guy, I'm gonna get pi over four comma one, which I know seems really kind of silly to have pi over something be an x value, but I can graph that just like we graphed pi over two. We'll have this pi over three comma root three that I'm not gonna plot precisely, and we'll see why in a second. And then on the negative side, I have negative pi over four comma negative one. And I'm gonna go ahead and plot those three points so that we can see them on here. Well, zero, zero is gonna be nice and easy. It would be that point right there at the origin. For pi over four and negative pi over four, that is half the distance to pi over two. So if I'm thinking about this and kind of ignoring the pi, this is a half, and so a fourth would be half the distance to a half, so that will give me positive pi over four here, and then half the distance to my negative pi over two will be negative pi over four and I'll have those two x values labeled on my graph. So as we can see, we actually have five points, or not five points yet, but five labels on our x-axis. The y-coordinates to go with pi over four and negative pi over four are up at positive one, so I'm gonna label one as right there, and I'll get that coordinate pair. And then likewise, we get a negative one 
down here and I'll label that guy symmetric as I could that seems a little bit too far maybe down so let's just to keep it as balanced and as symmetrical as we can we have that coordinate pair at pi over 4 comma 1 and then at negative pi over 4 comma negative 1 <coughs> Now the reason I had us graph the pi over 3 was just to get an idea of how this graph is going to curve. So pi over 3 is going to be in between pi over 4 and pi over 2. It's not going to be perfectly halfway, but what I'm noticing is that it's not increasing too quickly exactly. Root 3 isn't even bigger than 2 since 3 is less than 4 and root 4 equals 2. So this graph is actually going to produce a curve shape similar to kind of like what a cubic graph would look like. It's going to curve up on the positive side and likewise on the negative side we're going to get this curving shape coming down from there and this curve is what a standard cycle of tangent looks like so this is one standard cycle that we call it I have one complete pattern here what's going to happen on either other sides of these asymptotes is this pattern is going to continue to repeat and repeat which I will draw out for us in a second but I want us to just kind of look at what happens with one of these cycles and define some of the things that are going on here so the period remember is the horizontal distance of one cycle so for sine and cosine my period was where my graph ended I started at zero and I ended at that period and I either had that sine wave or I had the roller coaster shape that we have going well, tangents differ not only because we have the vertical asymptotes, that's definitely causing this graph to be different, but I also am no longer starting at just x equals zero and going to the right to get one standard cycle. Instead, I have this graph that is symmetric with respect to the origin. So I've got this negative side on the left and the positive side on the right. So the period is kind of in disguise on this graph. So the period is the distance that we traveled here so instead of me being able to look at my graph like, oh, it's pi over 2 because that was my largest value. That worked for sine and cosine, but that's not going to work for tangent. Instead, we have to go back to the definition way back at the beginning that we talked about in order to compute the horizontal distance. It will be my final value minus my initial value, since that will be the distance that I traveled. So my f largest value over here is pi over 2, although we're not technically ever reaching pi over 2. We're getting infinitely close to it. And likewise, my smallest value on the left is negative pi over 2. So when I simplify that, I would end up getting pi over 2 plus pi over 2, which would give me 2 pi over 2, which would be equal to pi then. So here is another thing that we're already seeing different compared to sine and cosine graphs, is a tangent graph has a period that is only equal to pi, which means those cycles recur quicker than it would for a standard cosine or sine graph. The other thing that's different is we have these vertical asymptotes. So I'm going to just write out our equations for the vertical asymptotes that are on the standard graph. So for just the standard graph, I'm getting them at plus or minus pi over two. And make sure you have that x equals piece of this because they are representing vertical lines. So just stating plus or minus pi over two is just giving values versus giving the actual equations of the vertical asymptotes. Now the other thing we talked about with sine and cosine graphs is the amplitude. Well, on a, both a sine and a cosine, it hit a max at one and it hit a minimum at negative one and it kept oscillating, meaning going up and down, up and down in between one and negative one. Well, the difference here on a tangent graph is this keeps going up and up and up towards positive infinity to the right and down and down and down towards negative infinity on the left side. What that means is I actually have no amplitude then for a tangent graph because there is no max y value slash no ma minimum y value for these guys. Yeah. So this is all of our information about a standard graph of tangent. Now this pattern does continue to repeat just like it did for sine and sine. So I get an infinite amount of these in either direction. If I think about this like my stamp, I would continue to stamp these down, which means I'm gonna get more asymptotes as this graph keeps going. So I'm gonna extend it out just so that we can kind of see what's happening here, just to get an idea in both directions. Now I'm not gonna ask you guys to graph more than just one standard cycle, but just so you guys really see the full picture of what's happening, I think it's important too. So our next one, I'm going to have another vertical asymptote, and it's going to be the same distance apart. So if the distance on my standard one was pi, then my next distance is also going to be pi. So this next asymptote is going to happen 
at 3 pi over 2 then, and halfway in between that, which is at pi, I'm going to be at 0, and I'm going to go up, and then I'm going to have this piece going down to the left, and then I would get another one, and this would keep going on forever and ever. Again, I've got to move a distance of pi, so if I add 2 pi over 2, or pi to this, I'd end up at 5 pi over 2, with my halfway point being 2 pi, and I'm getting another graph from here. Likewise, I also have the negative side happening, and it oh, looks like I only have space to draw one of them, so this would be at negative 3 pi over 2 will be my vertical asymptote, negative pi will be where it crosses the x-axis, and I have the positive and the negative piece of that. Now again, just to reiterate, this does keep going on forever and ever, but I've run out of space on the page to keep drawing them. But I'm only going to ask you guys, and as we do these examples throughout this video, we are only going to look at graphing one standard cycle here. So what's happening at the graph that is centered around the origin? Okay. The other piece that's going to be similar to sine and cosine is we're not going to do any stretch or any shifting. So I'm not going to do any translations that shift this left, right, up, or down. Instead, we're just going to focus on what happens when I have a stretch or compress whether that's a vertical stretch or compress, so I'm expanding the graph up or condensing the graph down, or if that's a horizontal stretch or compress that ends up changing the period value and where the asymptotes occur. So this looks similar to what we had for cosine and sine. We're going to look at the equation y equals a times tangent of bx, where a cannot equal 0, b is greater than 0, and x is in radians. What will then happen is similar to what we had for sine and cosine. The first piece is that pi over b is going to be the period of a function. Now where this piece is coming from is that up here on my standard graph, we knew that the period for one standard graph was pi, so pi over b is going to horizontally stretch or compress that distance for us. I will then have vertical asymptotes at x equals plus or minus pi over 2b, or another way to think about that is I'm going to half the period length to get the vertical asymptotes. So you guys are going to hear me say the word half a lot throughout this because tangent is really all about how do I continue to half things. Once I have the period, I'm going to half that to get the vertical asymptotes. I'm going to have to half it again to get enough points to see the shape of this graph. And then just like we've seen all the way back to first semester back in August, is if a is less than zero, so if I have a negative number in front of that, now there might be a stretch or compress, but the negative piece is also producing a reflection over the x-axis. Just like with sine and cosine, we're going to need certain things that are going to be required for our graphs to be able to get full credit and just to help show all of our work that is there. So you guys will have to list what the period is and list what the equations of the vertical asymptotes are. So make sure they are equations, meaning I should have x equals to start them all off since they are vertical <coughs> and then we'll need three points that are equally spaced in between those. So when I look at these three points if we go back up here I'm going to kind of highlight them for where they were here. So I have 0 0 since I was kind of centering this graph and then I had what was happening at pi over 4 comma 1 and negative pi over 4 comma negative 1. Now when I look at a graph of this and we just think about transformations, no matter what stretch or compress I do to 0, 0, I can stretch it vertically, I can compress it, I can stretch it horizontally, or I could compress it, 0, 0 is not going to be able to move there. Because when you do a stretch or compress, you're multiplying to that coordinate, and since 0, 0 both has coordinates of 0, no matter what I multiply to that, will always stay at 0. So 0, 0 is, for us, always going to be one of those points on these graphs that we have. Now in future classes, when you guys do shift these uh, left, right, up, or down, then of course 0, 0 is going to move. But for the sake of this section and just introducing a graph of tangent to you, we're going to keep everything not shifted. We're just going to stretch or compress. But what is really going to change is these two other points that we have right here, at pi over 4, comma 1, and negative pi over 4, comma negative 1. Now those are going to change drastically depending on how we're stretching or compressing this, both horizontally and vertically. So we will need those three points, but zero, zero is kind of a gimme there that we'll always have, and we'll find the other two from there. Mm -hmm. 
So let's look at our first example. It says graph one complete cycle, so I'm only gonna ask for one cycle on there for the following functions, list the period and the equations of the vertical asymptotes. So on the side over here, I'm gonna just kind of label this for ourselves. So we have our period that we're trying to find and we'll have that answer that we'll fill in. And we also have our vertical asymptotes, which I'm gonna shorthand with a VA for vertical asymptotes. When we look at this, our equation this time says y equals tangent of 2x. So our general form, remember, was y equals a times tangent of b times x. So for this example, our a value is going to be 1, because I have my invisible 1 there in front of my tangent, and my b value will be 2. What I'm going to start by finding is our period. So in general, the period for a tangent graph, if I write it up here to this top is always going to be pi over b. So for our example, if our b is 2, our period then will be pi over 2. And now remember that is the distance between my two vertical asymptotes. So pi over 2 isn't going to quite appear on my graph. It's more going to be part of the graph when you start to look at how all of these pieces are connected. Now to get my vertical asymptotes, there's two ways to think about this. We can either just take half the period length or if we want to kind of focus in on the equation, that was pi over 2b, which of course you're getting by just taking half the period since we're dividing by 2. So for this one, why don't I do it using kind of the more equation format? And so we'll get pi, oops, actually I'm going to do it off to the side so we have some space for our final answer. So I'll have pi over 2 times 2, which would end up giving me pi over 4 then. Now to write my final answer for our vertical asymptotes, I need them to be lines, vertical lines, so x equals, and then again we do get both the positive and the negative of this, so x equals plus or minus pi over 4. From here we can kind of start graphing this already. So our next step when we had sine and cosine graphs was we went through and we tried to find that length of interval and go back and find all the other points in between, but so far really with the vertical asymptotes that's giving me a lot already. So I'm going to start by plotting the vertical asymptote, so I'm going to put them right on, we'll go right here since it did condense it down. So this will be positive pi over 4, and I want to make sure that I'm labeling it, and then making this as symmetric as I can since I'm at negative pi over 4, and also wanting to label that piece. We know that 0, 0 is going to be on there because no matter what stretch or compress, that guy's not moving. And I know that I need these halfway points in between. Now I don't really have a name for them except for we can call them like the halfway points or the midpoints between them that I'm missing. But to get those kind of other two points, I need to take my vertical asymptote value and divide by two. So again, we're going through this process of our original value halving it. So for us, we're going to take pi over four divided by two. But remember, that's the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. So technically I'm dividing by 2 over 1, so I'll be multiplying by 1 over 2. So I end up getting pi over 8 then. And that will be my value on both the positive side, which will be positive pi over 8, and the negative side, which will be negative pi over 8. Now a lot of people tend to get confused with this because you start to think, well wait, 8's bigger than 4, but I should go smaller to bigger. But remember, these are in the denominator, and so when you put a bigger number in the denominator, the entire fraction is becoming smaller. So pi over 8 is actually smaller than pi over 4 because 8 is a bigger number and it's in the denominator. So you always kind of want to check and make sure, do my points actually make sense here? You don't want to just blindly follow rules and think without thinking about really what's happening here and how are you putting all the pieces of our puzzle together. So it does make sense that pi over 8 would come first before pi over 4 because 1 8 is smaller than a fourth. The last piece I need is, well, I know what the x values are. Well, now I need the y values. Well, that goes back to our vertical stretch or compress that I would have, which is always coming from our a value. But since our a is equal to 1, I'm neither stretching nor compressing it, and there's no reflection either, so I'm up at positive 1 and then down at negative 1. So when I go to sketch this, I'll have the positive curve going kind of down and up, similar to what a cubic function kind of looks like, and then going out and over. And remember, you're getting infinitely close to the vertical asymptotes, but you are not crossing them. Hmm.
Okay, let's look at our second example here. I think this would be a great idea for you guys to pause the video and try this one on your own first and see how you do. Okay, let's go ahead and check it. So I'm gonna start again with what are kind of my A and my B values so that I can see well what's affecting this graph. Well, A is the number that's being multiplied in front, so my A value is three, and then B is what's being multiplied to the X, so my B value is actually gonna be one half, and the reason being is that X over two is the same thing as one half times that X. So the one half then is our B value. The two things that we're first asked to kind of state would be what is our period, so we'll state that guy, and then what is the equation for our vertical asymptotes, and we will state those as well. So let's start with the period value. So the period in general, remember, is pi over b. So for us, I have one half is my b value, so when I have pi over one half, I'm gonna need to simplify this down. Well, dividing by a fraction is the same thing as multiplying by a reciprocal, so I'll multiply by two over one, so I end up getting two pi then, as our period here. So if we compare this back to our first example that we looked at, our period here was pi over two. So this was, on our first example, we were actually horizontally compressing it down and it was getting tighter. Now we're horizontally stretching it because this is separating the whole distance more that we have. Now to get our vertical asymptotes, remember there's two ways to do it. Um, you can think about halving your period. So the equation will be x equals plus or minus pi, since pi is half of two pi. Or if you prefer kind of thinking through the formula, it's pi over two b. Let me separate the period stuff. So this would be pi over two times a half, but two times a half is one, so I get pi over one then. Make sure again to have that x equals since it is an equation. Now from here, since we are graphing a tangent, my vertical asymptotes are really the first thing that I wanna put down on this graph since it's really gonna shape what this will look like. Well, since these are bigger values, I'm gonna stretch them kind of all the way out so we can maybe see a little bit of the horizontal stretch as much as possible. So making sure to label it so I have pi and then I have negative pi on the left side over here. Again, we know that zero, zero, no matter what I do stretch or compress wise is not gonna move. Since I have no horizontal or vertical shifts, I just am stretching and compressing. So the next thing I need is, well, what are these halfway points in between? Now, some of you might be able to look at these right away and say, oh, well, if I have a whole pi, then my halfway point would be half of that. So this would be pi over two and negative pi over two. If you prefer to compute those values out, as you're starting out, remember it's your vertical asymptote divided by two. So if my vertical asymptotes were at plus or minus pi, then I'll end up with that pi over two. So this is a nice example where you can kind of see, well, I found my period first, I took half of that to get my vertical asymptotes, and I took half of that again to get these other points just to help me get the shape of my graph. The last piece I have here is, well, what's the y coordinate gonna be with these plus or minus pi over two values? and that's where our a value comes in. So in our first example, our a value was one, so there was no vertical stretch or compress. Now my a value is a positive three, so this is actually being stretched up here at positive three. So I'm gonna have pi over two comma three, and then stretched all the way down on the negative axis as well. So I'll be at negative pi over two comma negative three. There is no reflection since that a value is negative, so these will be what I get. Now this is really tempting to kind of want to be like, oh cool, straight line, let me draw it. But remember these graphs are still curving, it's just gonna take a while for these to curve more than the last set did. So if I keep drawing that vertical asymptote up, that kind of went a little sideways, so let's edit that down and make that go more straight. Whoops, I didn't mean to erase that too. So this is just gonna take more time, but eventually it is reaching it. But we can see now that this has both been stretched vertically and horizontally, so it's gonna be, it's a less of a curve, but it is still curving. Likewise over here, this is curving down, and then it would keep going. Now I don't wanna keep drawing the vertical asymptote of the graph into the next example, but you can see how this is gonna slowly keep going down and eventually reach that vertical asymptote. We can kind of already see from our first two examples what happens when you have this vertical 
or this horizontal compress in the first example tightened everything together versus this horizontal stretch and a vertical stretch is really spacing everything out a little bit more in these graphs. Mm -hmm. We have two more examples that I'm going to have us look at. Now would be a great time for you guys to pause the video and try the third example on your own first. Okay, let's check example number three. So I'm gonna start again by just listing our A and our B since they really do kind of determine what happens to this graph. So our A value is one half and our B value is three. To get going, I need to know, well, what's that period length and what is that vertical asymptote? or the two vertical asymptote equations. So for our period, remember it's pi over b, so in this case I'll get pi over three then. Now this pi over three value won't be specifically written out on our graph, but remember it will be the distance between our two vertical asymptotes. And speaking of those vertical asymptotes, I wanna make sure I have my x equals plus or minus since they're vertical asymptotes, so they are vertical line, and I will have both the positive and the negative. When I compute those guys out, I'm gonna take half of the period. So one way to do it would you could be to say pi over three divided by two, which again, I gotta multiply by the reciprocal there to get one half. So I end up with pi over six for my vertical asymptotes. If you prefer to use the equation, the other way that you could compute that out would be to compute pi over two times b. So this would be pi over two times three, which will then give you that pi over six. So either way you're thinking about doing it, you are ultimately doing the same thing where you are dividing by two. You just don't have to worry about kind of multiplying by the reciprocal when you use kind of the more formulaic way there. Okay. I can now plot our pi over six vertical asymptotes on our graph. So if I'm kind of trying to keep them as best as I could. Pi over six is gonna be even smaller, but I wanna make sure I have enough space, so I'm gonna go ahead and just stick them right here. I want to make sure that I'm labeling this, so I have my pi over six on the right side, and then my negative pi over six on the left side. The next piece that we're gonna go from here is trying to find those halfway points again. So I know that I have one point at the origin. The next two pieces that we're trying to find will be halfway in between those. So an easy way to do that is think, well, vertical asymptote I need is where my bigger value is and I need to take half of that. So I'll have pi over six divided by two. Again, I need to multiply by the reciprocal. So I'll be multiplying by one half. So I end up with pi over 12 then. So I have pi over 12 on the right side and then negative pi over 12 on the left. Now I haven't said anything, but you guys are probably noticing I keep putting the negative one above mainly just because I know the graph's gonna come down here and I don't want it to be in my way when I go to graph it then. Just like I know on the right side my graph will be above so I've been labeling it below. Now you don't have to do this, you can definitely put it below above as long as it is labeled. The next piece I need is, well, what's the y coordinate with these? That's where the a value comes in. So this a value of one half is telling me that I am vertically compressing this down. So if one is up here, then one half is making it even smaller. So this is, is kind of the opposite of example two where it's gonna curve a lot quicker then. Likewise, down here, I have my negative one, negative one half value that we have. There is no negative, A is a positive number, so there's no negative sign in front of our tangent, so there's no reflection I need to worry about. So I can go ahead and do my final graph there. As you can see, it curves a lot faster on both sides as it reaches out to our vertical asymptotes. Mm -hmm. Let's go ahead and look at our last example. So our last example that we have on here says y equals negative two times tangent of x over four. And I'm gonna again suggest that you guys try this one on your own first by pausing that video and then we'll check it together. Okay, checking this guy, I have an a value of negative two. So this is a little different than I've seen. That negative sign's gonna play a role here, a very important one. Our b value is one fourth. 
because remember that x over 4 can be rewritten as 1 fourth times x. So our b value is the whole 1 fourth. I do need to find, figure out well, what is the period of this graph, although it doesn't appear on the graph, it's fundamental to kind of getting the rest of the problem down. So our period value, remember, is pi oops, over b. So for us, we have, let's separate this, pi over 1 fourth. So when I multiply by the reciprocal, I get pi times 4 over 1. So our period value here will be 4 pi. So this is definitely stretched that out compared to a regular cycle, where our, if I had a standard cycle, our period length would just be pi. This is taking a lot longer to get that full complete cycle that we have here. Now my vertical asymptotes, I wanna make sure I have equations. So I should have my x equals plus or minus. Now to get those, they're half the value of the period. So if my period is four pi, then half of that would be two pi. Another way to think about that is for your vertical asymptotes, they are pi over 2b. So when I simplify and kind of sub in our b value, I get pi over 2 times a fourth. So I get pi over a half, which when I multiply by the reciprocal then is giving me pi times 2, technically over 1, so I end up with that 2 pi. I'm going to go ahead and plot those kind of as far out as I can here because this is definitely horizontally stretched this graph and I do want to make sure I'm labeling it. So I have the positive side and then I have the negative one over here at negative two pi. I'm gonna erase this so that I, we're not getting confused by what's on our graph. So I have my negative two pi. Since there's no um, shifting of the graph, I know zero, zero will be on there. And the last thing I kind of have to go ahead and find are, well, what are those in-between values? Well, looking at this, if this guy's up here at two pi, well then half of two pi would be pi, and then would also, on the negative side, would be negative pi. If you prefer to compute it out, remember it's your vertical asymptote divided by two. So when we do that, it's two pi over two, and the twos cancel, and we just get left with pi then, which is how I got those two values. The last thing left to think about is, well, what's happening vertically now? How is this stretching or compressing, and is there a reflection? So I am stretching this since the absolute value of my a is bigger than one, so I will be stretching it up here at two and then down at negative two. The difference, though, is because that's negative, there will be a reflection. So if I had my original graph, I would be up here at pi comma two, but because there's a reflection, instead of having a point up here, I'm gonna have my point down here. And likewise, normally, I would have a point down here at negative pi comma negative two, but because of the reflection, I will be up here at negative pi comma positive two. I still have the same curvy shape. Oops. So this is gonna curve down and up, and likewise on this side, it's gonna curve down and around as it slowly grows closer to our vertical asymptotes. Now that is our last example for learning target 13E graph.